See, here's the problem. This is massive spoilers, just right off the bat, but at the same time, it's kind of not me that's spoiling it, because if you want to watch, season one is one and only, season two is forever and ever. Um, Rin Jaloon plays Zhou Shang Chan in both seasons. But, if you don't want any spoilers whatsoever about the show, for one thing, you can't watch this video. For another thing, don't even look up what the shows are about. Because, on my drama list, and on Aichia, doesn't matter where you go, in the descriptions of these shows, it's already spoiled. It's they, all official everything whatsoever you look up of descriptions and stuff, they spoil it. In case you hadn't noticed way back in the other video, if you watched it, Zhou Shang Chan was the only one that I did not show any pictures of. Because to show him in season one and in season two, and the difference between him, it's already spoilers just showing pictures of him. So, it's kind of like massive spoilers, but at the same time, it's not me doing it. It's it's not my fault. It's like automatically, it just is. So that's the, the, as fair of a warning as I can tell you. Even telling you that there's a massive spoiler to that degree is already a spoiler. Okay. Now that I have that out of the way, I am going to just talk about it. <sighs> Sorry. The thing is, I don't remember if this one actually came from a book or something, but like, without a doubt, when season one and season two were made, this is the one that I say if you look up like behind the scenes stuff, they actually filmed forever and ever before they filmed one and only. But one and only is the first season and forever and ever is the second season. In a way, I don't understand why they filmed them backwards. In another way, it makes perfect sense to me because of the type of story each season is. But yeah, I have to just come out and say right off the bat, the reason that this is two different characters, even though it's the same character, is because it's a story of reincarnation. I do not agree with reincarnation. Numerous reasons why. If you want to know why reincarnation is not something you should be believing in, go look up Doreen Virtue. Go look up Melissa Doherty. Um, there's probably others on YouTube, but I can't remember for sure. I know those two. Both of them used to believe in it. Doreen Virtue used to be one of the number one psychics for years. She was one of the best psychics. And she became a Christian and all of that went out the window because she doesn't believe in it anymore. And Melissa Doherty used to be part of the New Age and she became a Christian and all of that went out the window. She doesn't believe in it anymore. And both of them have been there. They both believed in reincarnation. They both believed in all kinds of stuff like that. So when the, in their videos, they are really good. Like I myself have never believed in reincarnation. No part of it has ever made any sense whatsoever to me. But if you want to understand about it, um, those two are really good ones to go listen to because they have been there. They did believe it. They had the reasons for believing it. And then they had the reasons for not believing it anymore. And they do a really good job of coming from a place of understanding to a place of understanding. So I would recommend go and listen to their videos. Um, yeah, as for me, reincarnation itself does not make sense. Every, like, every different individual that believes in reincarnation, I swear, has their own version of it. Every religion has their own version of it. It is so messed up and so complicated and so confusing and so, I just have to say, just so dumb. Um, nothing about it ever jives. Nothing about it ever fits. Nothing about it. Anyway. I just can't understand it. Therefore, I sound like I'm being harsh. I'm not going to call anyone stupid for believing in it because, in a way, there's tiny little things about it that I get why people would believe it. But I'm telling you, the further you dig into it, the less sense it makes. And, like, I am not calling people stupid for believing in it. I'm just saying <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It just... I've told you before, I'm a really logical thinker. And there is nothing about reincarnation that actually makes sense. If you dig really deep into it and be really honest with yourself, it just does not make sense, no matter how you frame it. There's always something that just doesn't make sense. And if you are a Christian, I'm going to tell you straight up, no, it does not jive with the Bible. The Bible does not teach reincarnation. It does not. You cannot hold to both beliefs at the same time. You just can't. You literally can't. And again, Doreen Virtue and Melissa Doherty both talk about why. Um, so yeah, 
that's my spiel on that. And so, <laughs> in case you hadn't noticed my reactions to other stuff, whenever reincarnation comes into the story, I'm like, oh. But this is the one and only ever period end of story ever where the reincarnation was kind of necessary. <laughs> Because massive spoilers that even the drama places spoil for you. So I'll put the warning spoiler. But at the same time, it's not me spoiling it. If you look up any descriptions whatsoever. And if you know anything about, like, I mean, reincarnation. Uh, yeah, you know this is coming. The characters die at the end of One and Only. Both of the main characters die at the end of One and Only. Forever and ever, they're both reincarnations. So they're kind of the same person, kind of not. So that's why his name is Joe Shang Chang in both of them, but I consider them two different characters because they are actually very different. And Forever and Ever is an extremely character-driven drama. There is some action that happens in it, but it's extremely character-driven. And I've said before that I'm not a fan of character-driven stories. They are so boring in the long run. And I do believe that Forever and Ever went on way too long. On one hand, it was needed because... Like, the end of One and Only shatters you. I, it literally would have completely shattered me, and I would have been shattered for weeks. It is, like, absolutely, like, gut-wrenchingly, heart-shatteringly, such a tragedy. It is so sad. It is... The weight is too heavy. Forever and ever is necessary to save your sanity. It's necessary to put your heart back together because one and only is just crushing the way it ends. And I'm just being completely honest there. One thing that, um, like, like I say, reincarnation stories are so weird. Some of them, the people end up remembering who they were in the past. Uh, like, bringing their memories back and whatever. And some, I think the majority, if not all of the ones I've seen before this, the people at least sort of remember their past life. But in Forever and Ever, that one itself, it's not just that it's character driven, it's also that it itself is not one of my favorites because the ending was a little bit odd to me. The way they did the ending, it's like, she is the main girl and Zhou Sheng is the main guy and she kind of has these glimpses and like they're more like feelings she remembers the feelings than rather than the memories and then at the end of forever and ever it's like she has a really long dream and remembers everything about her past life but when she wakes up it's like emotionally she's impacted by it and she just feels like it's real but at the same time it's not like she knows for a fact that it is actually real and it's actually her that lived that. It's more like a dream that she just connected with so much it might as well have been her. Because she can tell you all the details and she's crying about it and it was like really sad and impactful the way that she was reacting and everything. If you've seen one and only and you're like... <laughs> but at the same time, Jo Sheng... He read the story that she wrote, and it's like, okay, I'm willing to believe that, that this is how it happened back then, just because you told the story so well, and I I believe you. And it's like, in a way, he, un he believes that this is a possibility, but it's not... It's like he doesn't really connect himself, necessarily, to it. Like, he is Zhou Shang Chan from One and Only. It's like, he's like... Because it's really funny, and forever, ever they set it up. Zhou Shang Chan from One and Only is a part of Zhou Shang Chan from Forever and Ever's family tree. He is part of like his, like he, he's one of his ancestors. Zhou Shang Chang is one of Zhou Shang Chang's ancestors. That's the way they set it up in Forever and Ever. So it's like what was written down in the history books, which actually makes me kind of mad because considering who was on the throne at the end of One and Only, I'm like he didn't correct any of that. He should have known that a lot of that was lies, and yet he got on the throne and never corrected it? You jerk! Zhou Shang Chang pretty much dies for him, and for a couple other people that ends up being why he died was for this guy, and he didn't bother correcting the incorrect history? 
there must have been some kind of political reason why or something or maybe somehow he didn't understand all of what actually happened so he believed in himself but I'm like that's just mm, that makes me mad how could you because in forever and ever there's all this confusion and it's like most people actually believe that uh, Joe Shang Chen from one and only was a traitor and they believed all the lies that were put up or there's enough confusion but they're leaning on the side of it being um true and I'm like mm, 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 ah! And so by the end of uh, Forever and Ever, like, she had all these feelings of, like, she didn't think he was really a traitor and all this stuff. And of course she wouldn't because it's she. She never did believe he was a traitor. Um, so she makes up this story that she writes down in the book about what really happened and, and all of this stuff. And he's reading that. And it's like he believes that. But I don't understand whether the end of Forever and Ever is actually saying that he himself is connected to the fact that he is Zhou Shang Chen from One and Only or not. And I'm like... In a way, I wish they had, because this is like the healing cell, putting the band-aid back and like, you know, reforming the heart so it's not like in pieces all over the floor, like shattered glass. <laughs> they put me back together again, but at the same time, because they don't remember who they were. I mean, on one hand, it's a good thing that Zhou Shang Chan didn't remember, because a death like that is like, I'm floored by how horrible of a death that was. And for him, of all people, I'm like... <laughs> um, and like the spoilers of how like how he dies I mean the, the, the description in the thingy I thought they meant this is how it happens but then it actually happens like this and I'm like wait what the there was something about the way that it was wording I did not see that specifically the way he died coming I was like oh what no and then you know how on ITA like you can actually go and correct subtitles or like Add your own subtitles or submit your own subtitles. This is the one and only time as messed up as some of the subtitles are. And as much as I could go, like, I don't know, maybe you have to actually be a VIP member to do it. I don't know. But I have accidentally clicked on the submit subtitles or whatever before. And like, there's been so many times where they messed up and I wanted to correct it. But at the same time, I'm like, this would take too much work. And I don't know, whatever. The one time that I had to do it was because in forever and ever, she said something took six hours. And I'm like, nah, 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 this visceral reaction to it. I'm like, it took three hours and three hours was three hours too long. Don't you dare go and make the mistake of saying six hours. It was only three hours. Like three hours bad enough. Just the thought of saying like, even though I know it's wrong to say that it took six hours. I'm like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Three hours. It was only three hours, please. Three hours was too much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll get to, into more specifics in a minute. I'm just, in general, why I have to talk about these two at the same time. This is why. Uh, the ending of Forever and Ever sort of disappointed me because it was kind of weirdly disconnectedly weird. And it's one of those ones where I don't mind when time is passing and they don't tell me if it doesn't matter. But sometimes it's kind of... I need to know how much time is passing. And they don't tell you... Because at the end of Forever and Ever, she is in a coma. But they don't specify exactly how long she's in a coma. And as typical, when she wakes up from the coma, she is able to speak way too quickly. Uh, especially if it did take as long as it feels like they were saying. Because it feels like they were saying she was in a coma for at least six months. But, uh... Okay, it's a little unbelievable and weird. There's the, the ending of that one feels like they started skimming over stuff instead of... Because the end of Forever and Ever, okay, spoiler, again, he dies at the beginning of the second last episode. So there are literally two full episodes without Zhou Shang Chan. It's focusing instead on um, Shi Yi and her and everybody else that's still alive and how they handle everything that's going on after his death. That's one of the few shows I've ever seen where they literally kill the main character a full two episodes before the end of the show. It's like, oh, okay. Then in Forever and Ever, they reversed it by putting her into a coma. And he has to take care of her while he's injured and everything else is going on. But they don't tell you how long she's in the coma. And it's like, as soon as that ac accident... <sighs> not really an accident. We'll get there. Um, as soon as that happened to put her into the coma and him get injured onwards... It gets, I felt like I was suddenly disconnected from, in one and only, I still felt connected to it. it. There was a slight disconnect. The feeling of things was different because he wasn't there. And there was a slight disconnect. In Forever and Ever, I feel like the disconnect was a lot bigger. Like, they wanted to just hurry up and get past all this to bring them back together. And it's like, it felt like they were trying to make a point And they were trying to portray something and tell you something. But I can't grasp what it is. 
So I don't know if that's a big fat fail on my part or if that's a fail on their part. I'm not sure what happened with the end of that, but I feel like they disconnected me too much and I'm like kind of floating over here watching it instead of being there with them. All of a sudden, when through the whole thing, I was right there with them and then this happened and I'm like, I think that's still them over there. Like, So the ending of Forever and Ever was kind of annoying that way. And like I say, it's so vague on whether they actually ever realized who they were in the past or not. Say with Zhou Xiang Chan, I'm guessing like he didn't remember ever remember his past life because he didn't need to. Whereas she, the way she died, it was kind of like she had more, she had massive regrets and all kinds of stuff. And he only had one regret and that regret is fixed in forever and ever. So he didn't need to remember his past life or whatever whereas she kind of did or something like that that's what I felt like they were saying uh and like I say for him it's a good thing that he didn't it at the very least that he didn't remember his death because going through that once is way more than enough he doesn't need to remember it and go through it again <laughs> she had flashes of her death but like yeah um so Zhou Shang Chen from Forever and Ever is not one of my favorite characters um, like I say, that might just be because he's boring. <laughs> His job is a scientist researcher, scientific researcher. And it's really cool that he does stay within that throughout the entire show because like the way he approaches life, everything about life, he's kind, he's, like I say, he's like extremely shy, very, very shy and slightly naive because he's like very socially awkward. He's not good at connecting with people and talking with people because his family is extremely large and extremely complicated and they've had issues ever since he was born all the way through it there's been like all these big secrets in the family and things they're not supposed to talk about and things that are affecting people like the elephant in the room that nobody talks about and all kinds of stuff like that has been going on since day one all the way through and he cares a lot about his family and in a way that was kind of odd the way he reacted to something that I'll get to in a minute and in another way like it is within his character but it's also a little bit odd that he went that far with it but so he that's his job as scientific researcher and everything even when he's approaching people and building relationships with people and in specifically his relationship with her it's he he's it's like he takes it as a scientific researcher like like he doesn't understand something so he approaches it like a researcher and it's, it's cool how it consistently like that he is throughout the entire thing. Um, he, he's so shy and he is on point, but at the same time, he's so slow in other ways. I mean, honestly, that is his wife and he still can't even hold her hand in public. Even after they sleep together, they're walking down the street and someone's coming along. He quickly lets go of her hand. I'm like, <laughs> dude. He's also awesome in his steady patience and straightforward, like on track of being a researcher. Also, he says, he right up front says, it takes a while for me to warm up to people and he stays true to that. It does take him a while. And it's not just a character driven drama. It's also because of the whole setup the way it is. Like, it's really, really interesting. This is like, really well done storytelling whoever it was that wrote these stories the story for one and only and forever and ever and how they fit together is so well done um because like the similarities between the lives like his large and complicated family and um power that his family holds and the wealth of his family and all that stuff is like the same basically and um uh was this? takes him a while to I haven't got to one and only yet, but in Forever and Ever, the way it's set up to inherit anything from his family, his dad who passed away within his will says that Zhou Shang and his brother, before they get to inherit anything, it's a requirement that they get married. So <laughs> Zhou Shang and Shi Yi meet at the beginning of the show and because of his name, because she in Forever and Ever is a voiceover, she's a voice actress, and she's been doing the voiceover for <laughs> one and only, for the story of one and only. 
And so she's like Zhou Shang Chen, that's like a name for her. She's like done a lot of research and she's into the story and all this kind of stuff. So when she randomly hears his name at the airport, she's like, uh, you have the same name as that guy. So she can't help approaching him. And they exchange emails, email addresses. And for the next like six months, they're emailing each other. And then it turns out that he's going to be in the specific place that one of her friends is going to for work. So she goes along with her friend and she meets up and sees um, Zhou Shang for the first time in person in six months. And there's a connection there, uh, of course. So they, 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 they kind of know each other and they've kind of, I think they go on a couple of, I think they meet up in person a few times. Not very many though. It's not very many at all. They like kind of sort of like in person, barely know each other when... This comes out that he has to be married before he can inherit stuff. And on one hand, he's got no interest in the family business. He wants to just continue being a researcher. That's all he wants to do is being scientific. But he knows there are problems within the family, especially when it comes to his brother. Um, he knows that his brother is not an honest person <laughs> and is going in dangerous places. And the whole family and everything they own and stuff is probably going to go to very bad places if his brother's the one in control. So he takes the responsibility because he cares so much about his family. He knows he can't just ignore it all. So he literally proposes to Xi when they barely know each other. And she, without knowing why, like she doesn't understand why she's doing this because it doesn't make sense, but at the same time, reincarnations, etc. She says yes. So in Forever and Ever, they are... Like, his mother is extremely against this. She had someone else that she wanted him to marry, and he wasn't interested, so she's mad, and she's, like, extremely against Shi Yi for, like, the whole drama. Very much against her. She's getting in the way every chance she can get. She's getting in the way of them actually getting married. But Zhou Shang is stubborn. He proposes to her, and then at one point he decides that's it. Even if we can't, like, because even their their engagement banquet gets cancelled. So, never mind actually getting married, their engagement banquet, so they aren't officially even engaged. People don't necessarily hurt his family, at the very least, doesn't really. He's kind of engaged, but kind of not. And he gets to the point where he's like, you know what, I don't care. I'm, like, taking a stand on this. And he, like, literally asks Shi Shi Yi, I want to register our marriage. So there's like the registration form, like the legal on paper, you're married, and there's like you've actually had the wedding. So they don't have the wedding, but she agrees to legally on paper get married to him. So they legally on pa paper go and get married. So for most of the show, they are legally married, even though everybody is like skirting around it and half pretending that they aren't, and they're not allowed to live together and all of this stuff because they haven't actually officially had even the engagement banquet, never mind the wedding. So there's all these things getting in their way, but they do start living together, just kind of completely behind his, most of his, part of his family's back. The younger generation finds out about it and like, you know, shows up on his doorstep and the younger generation, like his youngest brother and all this stuff actually support him but even her parents don't know that they're legally married she doesn't even tell her parents that they are her parents or her aunt and uncle or her grandparents none of them know that they're legally married so they're seriously behind everybody's back married that's the whole everything that's happening in forever and ever and Zhou Shang Chen that's why I say he's actually a pretty cool character the way Jaloon played him like the shyness to the nth degree. He licks his lips so much and he sighs and lets his breath out so much because he's like so nervous all the time around people, especially when it comes to opening up his own heart and being emotionally vulnerable and stuff like that. And it's, it's like it's really hard for him to take a stand, but at the same time, once he does make up his mind, he doesn't back down. And that's like consistent throughout the whole thing. He's like... um yeah it's it's complicated how many different people and how many different things he's thinking of and how uh conscious of all that he is and in a way it's crippling but in another way like i say once he makes up his mind he does not back down from that and that is really cool um his grandma is adorable what else can I say about him? The weird thing about him, the only time in a way it felt like he was out of character, but the funny thing is because he's a reincarnation, he wasn't out of character, 
is when it comes to the end. I did not expect that out of the blue level of violence at the end. Oh my gosh. Um, there is, like, spoilers for this part. Maybe I won't even say who, but there is one character who ends up causing this scene where, like, Zhou Shang Chang almost dies. Like, it's like he was being attacked and his arm got broken in multiple ways and he got stabbed. Stabbing seemed to have been very minor, even though I swear he got stabbed there. But his arm got shattered and, like, he was pretty seriously injured. Uh, and she, while trying to stop him from dying, she's trying to stop the guy that's attacking him. And while doing that, she and the guy that's attacking them fall off because they were on the second floor. They go through the railing and hit the floor. The other guy dies. She goes into a coma. And while he is completely crushed and battered and barely hanging on, Zhou Sheng refuses to give up on Shi Yi, even though her parents... I get where they're coming from, but at the same time, I'm like, how dare you? I just want to come and strangle you both. You can see that he's physically broken. You can see that he's mentally broken. And yet you're like, nope, it's all because of you that our daughter is like this. And they like completely shove him forcefully out of her life. They won't let him into the hospital room. They won't let him anywhere near her. I'm like, <sighs> Part of it they didn't realize they were married so they think they're just boyfriend and girlfriend and all of this and like but even when they find out that they're actually legally married they're still like trying to get in the way and i understand it's because this came out of the blue all of a sudden their daughter's in the state and they think that she might never wake up again and it's his fault and all this stuff but i'm like oh especially when he is that physically and mentally broken and they're just like this is all your fault get out i'm like Take hmm. But I kind of, in, in a way, that whole scene in the theater, even the way he was dressed, I'm like, I don't feel like you're Zhou Sheng Chan from Forever and Ever anymore. I seriously feel like he reverted to being Zhou Sheng Chan from One and Only. Like, he is such a shy person and so quiet and so timid and so like he lets everybody else lead the way in so many ways throughout the whole thing especially when it comes to she she is the dominant one even in their relationship like it's her that starts just about everything the only thing that he initiated was the first time they slept together beyond that even the first time they kissed it's all her that initiates everything but then it comes to the theater scene and i'm like you suddenly have like a massive backbone that's like this is only the second time i've seen you with this type of presence this type of like you look at him and you back up a step kind of presence i'm like this feels way more like one and only joe shang chan oh i just realized that's really funny to say that because forever and ever was filmed first and yet it felt like he was reverting to the one and only who he hadn't even filmed yet so that is really funny <laughs> really funny because <laughs> the only other time you see him get physically like that is when another spoiler here a member of his family dies and it's pretty much the fault of another member of his family so this member of the family did something that caused the death of this member of the family this member of the family might have died anyway but when it comes down to it there was still a chance that they wouldn't die and it's because of this family member so he literally physically attacks this family member physically grabs him and is hitting him and all this stuff <laughs> i was like slightly left field there i didn't know you had it in you to get physical okay <laughs> whoa <laughs> joe shang <laughs> uh was not expecting that but then that's one thing that he portrayed julong uh, julong where'd that come from jaloon that is one thing that Jaloon portrayed super well is his reaction to the death of that family member and the slump that it put him into, the depression that it put him into, the, the, the loss of interest in anything and trying to hold it together but suddenly not being able to. And like there were several scenes like, um, actually now that I've seen him play Du Chuan, 
he's good at playing that. Uh, like I say, either he himself has had some kind of issues with depression or someone very close to him has and he's very empathetic or he's just really good at making things up in his mind because like he takes it when he goes through, when his characters go through things like this, he takes it to the level like he really understands this. This is not a understanding. I mean, it's not an understanding and it's not an understanding. It's like he really gets it. I don't like that. In, wow. Because like... Um, there's a few scenes where, like, he's just, like, sitting at the table like he's not even there and she just hugs him from behind. And there's, he went out shopping and she's like, where is he? Why is he not back yet? And she goes out to look for him and finds him sitting on the park bench and she's like, why on earth did you buy so much? And he's like, I don't know, I just started thinking of every meal that you've ever cooked since we got together and I bought all the ingredients and, like, I don't even know why. And she's like, okay, let's just go inside. And, <laughs> and then there's the scene with the bathtub where he's like supposed to be taking a bath and he's just laying there doing nothing. And she comes in and she's like, let me wash your hair for you. And she's washing his hair and he's just like unresponsive. And then like, he's just like, please hold me. And she gets into the tub with him and she's just holding him. And then it finally reaches the scene where <laughs> Can you hear it? I'm starting to get all emotional all of a sudden because I'm remembering it. Oh, hold on. This is how real it got. Oh, one second. Calm down. My face is going to turn red. I'm going to look stupid on camera. It reaches the point where uh, <clears throat> I'm probably going to have to put a picture on myself now. I don't like it when my face turns red on camera. <laughs> One sec, let me breathe. I have no idea whether I'm calm enough or not. I, um, there's the scene where he, I can't remember what led up to it, but where he, like, he finally ends up going into the other room to take a nap while she's preparing food. And he goes in there and he lays down on the bed and he finally has a complete meltdown. But he doesn't want her to hear him crying. So he's got his fist in his mouth and everything and like it's a combination of he doesn't want her to hear him and also maybe it's just so painful that it won't even come out because sometimes it gets to that point when you're crying where it's like you need it to come out but it won't come out it's just like crushing you the weight is so heavy and he did way too good of a job of portraying that I was like oh my gosh So, maybe I'll just go screen cap a bunch of pictures so you can see him melting down instead of me melting down. <laughs> Thanks, Jaloon. <laughs> oh, I've got actual tears in my eyes. Stop it. I didn't expect to do this in the middle of this video. <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> but okay, when I was doing... When I was talking about Miss... Mm, Crow and Mr. Lizard and what Gu Chuan was going through and I said it's very personal for me that's a whole different level of understanding like there's a lot about it that's like that's personal and in a way I probably just shouldn't talk about it at the same time as I don't know how to talk about it at the same time as whatever but um death and me have a relationship <laughs> uh so yeah the level of understanding is high with me. <laughs> so when I see it in shows, and when it gets really personal in shows, I have reactions. And that's why I say the ending of One and Only was absolutely crushing for me. Because it's... Oh, the level of. And then in even forever and ever, in case... I mean... <laughs> see me face! <laughs> that whole scene. And then there was another scene where it wasn't... Jo Shang slash it wasn't Jaloon, it was another actor and another character. There was another part later on in the show, another family member that uh there was a scene where Jo Shang and she she were gonna go to bed and this kid walks in. I call him kid because I think he was like eighteen at the oldest. And he walks in and says that he he he's kind of acting like when he first walks in, you think he's just being kind of like you have to understand his character and I don't want to get sidetracked too much. But then it turns out when she's like, okay, you can sleep in here and I'll go to somewhere else. She goes somewhere else and 
this other guy, I can't remember his name at the moment, um, but he and Zhou Sheng lay down on the bed, the, the kid reveals the fact that, like, he's struggling too, and he has nobody to talk to, and he is crushed and doesn't know how to handle all these emotions and what he's supposed to do with them. And Zhou Sheng, who has already had a breakdown, this is after his meltdown, he just, I can't remember exactly what he said or how he said it, but basically, like, if you need to cry, go ahead and cry. And a kid has a bit of a meltdown. And Zhou Sheng is like, <sighs> and it wasn't to the same degree of a meltdown that it showed, but even that scene, I was like, <laughs> Excuse me while I start crying again. <laughs> when Jaloon deals with death, with him, when his characters deal with death, that is how it's done. <sighs> okay. Now that I didn't expect to have a breakdown with Forever and Ever, we have to move over to One and Only. Um. <clears throat> oh my gosh, it's already 40 minutes long and I haven't even talked about One and Only yet. My word. Okay. Joshang Chan from One and Only is, I put him up as tied with Nalan Yue and Lu Yi. Um, my description of him, like, again, his family is large and complicated. The beginning of the show, he, I don't quite understand the ages. I think he was 13 when he left the capital city because his brother became the emperor. And the whole complexity of royal families back then, certain people were okay, other peoples were a major threat. Either the family themselves considered them a threat, and or the general public would consider them a threat. Because if they're around, they might try to, like, usurp the throne and all this stuff. So, the solution is to banish Zhou Shang from the capital city. <clears throat> he becomes the prince of... No, I'm going to have to look up the name and put it as the subtitles because I don't remember the name of the place. It just blew out of my head. It's like almost there and I can't remember it. So he goes out there and the funny thing is that that that, that like he's good, he's a threat so we have to kick him out. But at the same time, like maybe they expected him to die or something because he's 13 years old and suddenly he becomes a general. And from the age of 13 onward, he becomes this like epic general. He's so talented, like incredibly talented, and we get into exactly how and why, but it started from, I think they were saying he was about 13. And at the beginning, I mean, after, like at the beginning of the show when we first see him, I think he's like 18 or 19, and what happens then is that his older brother has died. And they're trying to put his nephew on the throne. So he ends up going back to the capital city. He's not, he was not planning on actually going into the capital city. He was going to keep his promise and stay outside the walls. But through the manipulation of his sister-in-law, horrible, horrible woman, just for the record, she's one of the main bad guys of the show. Through her manipulation of the people and the situation and everything, she basically forces him to have to break his promise and enter the city. When he enters the city... The only way out of all of this, like to show his support for his nephew and to prove that he's not there to usurp it or anything and that he's okay with supporting his nephew and letting his nephew be the one that's on the throne. Um, I think there was one or two other things he said, but one of the things he promises in front of everybody, in front of the throne, he promises that he will never get married and he will never have kids. That is the promise he makes at the beginning of the show. And that is why One and Only is one of the most romantic, most heartbreaking romances ever without ever actually being a romance. Um, the whole story of exactly why she became his disciple is a little complicated. It had something to do with there was bad blood between his family and her family from a while ago because of all the politics and everything that had happened before then. So I think they were saying like to repair some of that, she was go supposed to go and be his disciple. And he's like, but what am I even supposed to teach her? And they're like, anything but um, battle tactics and stuff. And he's like, but that's the only thing I'm good at. What do you, what, what? Hi. <laughs> uh, so like she literally at the, at the at the time that they asked him like at the time that he made his promises the same time that her uncle who's basically the head of the house because her father um that oh I forgot to mention that she in the past she can't speak because I forget how old she was now they specified I think it was even her birthday that her father left and she never knew why 
But the thing was that he was pegged as a traitor or something like that. So he, her parents were forced to divorce each other so that there was no repercussion on the mother and the daughter. They went back to the, her mother's original family and he got kicked out and died and his whole family got killed for this. She didn't know any of, any of that until way later. Zhou Sheng tells her at least part of that. But she can't speak. She literally lost her voice. She is not able to speak anymore. So for a whole lot of the show, one and only, she can't speak. She uses sign language. And I'm not sure how everybody in the sun understands sign language, but everybody seems to understand sign language. Her own family understanding is one thing, but for Zhou Sheng to understand enough to figure it out and for the other people to understand enough to be able to okay. I'm also unsure exactly how long she was with him before she could start speaking because she does get her voice back thanks to Zhou Sheng. But in like, this is the most interesting show I have ever seen for flashbacks because 90% of the flashbacks you see are things you don't see until you see the flashback. But they keep flashing back memories, her remembering her life living with Zhou Sheng and all of his other, I'll get there, I interrupted myself. Um, she keeps flashing back, but in all of her flashbacks, it's back to when she can't talk. So I'm like, the way they showed it at first, it almost looked like it was only like a year or something later, a year or maybe two, and she could talk again. But when all of the flashbacks are back to her not being able to speak, I'm like, I think they say it was about 10 years that they were together. It's starting to feel more like it was like eight years that she couldn't speak while living with him. I'm like, huh? So if anybody can explain that, if you know and you can explain that, exactly how long could she not speak while she was with him? I'm a little lost on that timeline. But anyway, it's, it's kind of a, not really important, but I'm like, her name slash nickname is Shi Yi, and that's 11 in Chinese. And it, cause, and he says that's just right, because he already has 10 disciples. He calls them disciples, but like, they're all generals underneath him, um, within his army. And that's the thing about One and Only, why it is one of my favorite shows too, because usually when there's a death like that at the end, when the whole thing is a tragedy, I can't take it, that crushes me, and I end up hating it, and I can't go near it, I can't touch it with a 50-foot pole, you have to take it away from me, just get it away from me, I hate it, I hate it when shows, like, end with everybody dying, or the, the most important people dying and all this stuff, especially the way they die and all this stuff, I'm like, I cannot take it, at least in this one, it's not like one of those ones where it's a stupid death that just made me angry, like, it was a weighty, crushing, horrible, horrifying death. But this one, this this story, it is so well done. Like, it is very rare for me to find a story where I love this many of the characters. Like, all of his generals are epic. When I talk about, like, having really good, strong female characters, he's got two female generals, and they are just as epic as the men. Like, they are all so cool. I love this cast. I love the way the story was put together. It is amazing. And it was not too long. It's, I think, 24 episodes. Forever and ever, I forget how many, was it 36? It really should have been only 24, like one and only. Forever and ever did go on too long. One and only, that was pretty much perfect. That was like just about exactly how many episodes you needed for this show. It was so well done, though. So what I wrote about Zhou Sheng, he is the general. And his relatives are the whole royal family. Like, he's connected to everybody. <laughs> and his family is large and complicated. Um, he himself is a very quiet person. He's the type where even though he's literally related to the emperor and he is a prince, he spends all of his time with his army. Like, they have incredible respect for him. All of them have incredible respect for him. I mean, the minute he walks on screen, one of the most breathtaking scenes you'll ever see in any show ever is him beating the drums while they're all affirming the, the beliefs they hold and their the determination and their strength and unity as an army and he's beating the drums to keep them on time and I'm like, that scene is one of the most powerful ever. Like, that's the first time she sees him and I feel like her. I'm like, I am blown away by this. And, but I, what I wrote about him is that he is seriously cool. He is so strong physically, mentally, and communally. And what I mean by communally is he is an epic leader. He's unafraid to say what needs to be said and do what needs to be done. And he is such a promise keeper, unless it's literally out of his control and he can't help not keeping it. Like when he was forced into the city against his will, but he had to be, he had to go in there. Nothing can make him stop doing what he believes is right. He is loyal as all get out. 
and he is adorable with the kids. When when you first meet his nephew that's on the throne, and he's like a child, he's like six or something like that, five or six, I think they said. And near the end, there's another child that's like five or six, and he's so cute with both of them. Jaloon the daddy. <laughs> I can tell he's a daddy. Um, but he is such a warrior. He is such a man. You want to know what a real man is? My word, he is a man. Um, he, it's, an, again, like Lu, Yen, Lu Yi and, and Yi Chong and stuff, he has a dangerous side to him that is not a joke. He is a general. He is a warrior. He is a soldier. And he is also a man that has things and people, etc., that he is going to protect. No matter what. And it's not just a selfish protecting. That's the thing. He is one of the most selfless characters that Jaloon has ever played. He is one of the most selfless, the most prideless, the most... He is not at all greedy. He, like... Um... Actually, I do get into that here. He's a dangerous side of him that isn't a joke, and people recognize it because of the reputation that he has built on his word and his actions. Like, he walks up and people know, even before he says anything. Like, they just know the reputation this guy has. The most unique thing about him is his comfort level with everyone around him. Like, everyone around him. Like, his whole comfort level with the army, everybody that he works with. Like, he walks around like a king, even though he's not the king. And it's not in a prideful way. The most unique thing about him is his lack of desire of any kind of fame and fortune. And it's not fake. It's real. He really is not interested in the money, and he really is not interested in the fame. He is not doing any of this for any type of personal gain. He feels bad that his generals are not getting the recognition they should, because, like, but even them, they're like, we're following, we aren't following you for the fame and the, and the fortune. We're like you. We're doing this because it's something that needs to be done. The people need us, therefore we are going to do what the people need us to do. That is why they're doing it. And that is why Zhou Sheng, in One and Only, is so amazing. Like, he's, he's probably one of the most impactful characters I've come across. <laughs> Especially because of the way, like, it's one of those rare stories where I'm like, I understand why he dies in the end. Because that is part of who he is. That makes him even more amazing. The fact that he dies. And it's the way he dies. And like... So... I don't know if you want to know how he dies or not. So it's a spoiler. If you don't want to know how he dies, wait until the words disappear and unmute it. But he literally... That, that's the one time where I'm like, okay, this is the one time where that was kind of stupid of you. You should have seen that coming through the whole show. He is so good at seeing things coming and he is so good at like battle strategy. He is a general and he stays consistent to that. He is so smart. He is so strategic. His whole army, not just him, he is not spotlit in any way, shape or form. Everybody in his arm, there is so much unity so much communication they talk to each other they understand each other they are on the same level from start to finish they are so good at the unity thing all of them and i'm saying even she it is epic in this show like i mean talk about the trust never being broken like ever it's between these guys all of them everybody in his army and she included but the one time he kind of failed was what the one time that ended up leading to his death. So, okay, now is where the spoiler starts. <sighs> he should have seen it coming and they ended up getting trapped because they didn't. So they were kind of vulnerable and there's no other way for them to get out. Basically, in the end, the lives of like, I can't remember how many people they said. I don't want to exaggerate, but I think it was something like 300 people. All of their lives were dangled above his head and said, either you give up now and if he goes up there, it's going to lead to death, or we're going to kill all these people right in front of you. And Zhou Shang has never been about himself. Like, his general, the girl that was with him, looks at him and she says, please, they've got a child. Um, the child that is supposed to be on the throne now, which is also a spoiler, the emperor that you see for most of the show dies, and I'm like, when he dies... I was personally, you stupid kid. 
It was also just, he was horrifying even the way he died. But so this kid, who's also related to Zhou Shang, but I don't remember how, but he is literally being held right in front of him. And they're like, we're going to kill this kid on top of all these other people if you don't give up right now. And his general is looking at him and she's saying, please, please, for once in your life, be selfish. Please walk away. Please live. Please think of yourself for once. And unlike in Blue Whisper, where the butterfly's like, why can't you just think of yourself for once? And I'm like, believe me, butterfly. She has never thought about anybody more than she's thought about herself. This is the exact opposite. Zhou Shang has never, he has given up so much in his life for the people. And he's done it so selflessly. Because they really do matter more than him, in his opinion. Not because he wants to die. Again, this is not a, like, suicidal thing where it's like, oh, I'm just going to heroically die. No, it's a genuine, he just can't have this kid die. He just can't do that. So he gives up. He gives himself up. His general and the other guy, like all of the others walk out. He's the only one that they catch because he's the only one they really want. They let all the others go. And even their lives were on the line if he didn't give up here. Even they would have died. There was three. Actually, one of them did die there. Spoiler. One of them did die there. Uh, all of this has got a spoiler above it. But there was like two or three of them that walked out. I think it was two of them that walked out with the body of the other one. And I can't remember. Did they take... Yeah, I think they took the kid with them. And the other officials and stuff weren't taken. But the kid and those two with the body got to walk out. Because he gave himself up. And because he gave himself up, he's now in the hands of this the most selfish person on the planet. The current emperor. Uh, and his person that helped him usurp the throne. Um, where was I? A message just popped up and distracted me. So he gives himself up there and they like, this, this guy hates him so much because of the power and the reputation and everything that has. He's like afraid of him. He's like this afraid of him. And the other guy hates him this much because he's like, he defeated him once before and all this stuff. And that's like I said, uh, mistakes that he makes is like being a little too nice. Sometimes there's like a couple of times where he lets someone go where it's like, why did you do that? And like, and this, like I say, this was a bit of a trap that he actually should have seen coming. So it's a little bit almost in a way out of character. I'm like, that's a little bit, he should not have been trapped that badly he should have seen at least part of this coming that's kind of bad that it got to the level of being trapped that badly in that way it was kind of a fail that shouldn't have happened being honest here I re <laughs> but it did happen and he got caught and he was in prison and she has no idea that this is going on because she's currently being this is another thing they're kind of holding over her she's kind of trapped at the moment um but so he, in the end, in the middle of the night, this emperor just like lies through his teeth and tells everybody that he is a traitor and that he was trying to like take over the throne and over the kingdom and all the rest of this kind of stuff. So he pegs him with all these lies and uses that to justify himself in the middle of the night. Zhou Shang Chang is literally dismembered for three hours. They're literally cutting him to pieces slowly for three hours while he's defenselessly being hung up there so he can't stop them <sighs> this is why i say uh, the second season the subtitle said six and i'm like no, 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 that wasn't six three was bad enough don't you dare even in my head i'm like no no no, no. three was bad enough don't say six it was not six it was three three was bad enough I say horrifying dismembered cut to pieces limbs and everything torn off and all the rest of this stuff dismembered for three hours in front of all the officials that he was trying to save the lives of actually all of them got killed too in the end because they obviously were so faithful to him that they never would have listened to the new guy so they all got killed too so kind of really the only person that he actually saved by doing this was the two people that were with him and the kid it's kind of the only people he actually saved by dying this way but even that i mean like that's good enough. He's like, for the kid. Huh. Just remembered for three hours. And the whole way they filmed the death scene and the way they had she reacting like she's having a nightmare and like as if she's being cut to pieces too. I'm like, oh, I can barely breathe right now. So, there's the weight of all of that. 
and how all of that happened. And it's because of that ending of one and only. And then, oh, brief back to spoilers again. The way she ends up dying, she ends up committing suicide. If she continues to live, the people around her that love her are trying to help her escape because they don't want her this stupid, selfish, horribly... Ugh! current emperor is forcing her to marry him and she doesn't want to and the people around her understand that she doesn't want to and all this stuff so they're trying to help her escape but if they do that they will all likely die especially her mother because there's no way her mother can get out of harm's way she will be killed for this and she's like she's like uh -uh. i can't let all these people die for me so she's like literally standing there looking at her freedom and she decides instead to go up and throw herself off the second floor like the this gate of the city so that's how she dies so back to like you know that's why the whole weight of that one because of everything with that that were spoilers so i don't know if you actually listened to it or if you muted it but because of all of that the ending of that one is absolutely crushing and that is the only reason why i'm okay with forever and ever being a reincarnation because i'm like Put me back together again. You shattered me and left me in like teeny tiny little shards all over the floor. So like, put me back together again. You, say it, man. And I think that's the only reason I made it through it to begin with, was because my drama list and everywhere and Aichia and everywhere, literally everywhere, spoiled it from the start. So I knew that a reincarnation was coming. So then I knew they were gonna die at the end of this one. So I knew it was coming. I just didn't realize it'd be quite to that degree. I knew it was coming, but yeah. <sighs> one scene that like incredibly stuck out to me, if you look up the poster for one and only, you will see she's standing there with her finger on um, Zhou Shang's nose. She's got her finger like this because she's running her finger down his nose. The poster does not give that scene credit. The way the poster is, it's almost kind of awkward. And I'm like, that's kind of cute and like whatnot. But when you actually get to that scene within the show, I'm like, that is one of the most impactful most innocent, romantic, amazingly beautiful scenes I've ever seen. The way they filmed it and the way she's got her finger there and the way he leans forward because they can't be together. They're not allowed to be together, even though both of them, because the way the show ends, the show does it, she, when she first comes to him, is already engaged to somebody. During the show, that engagement is canceled. So they think it's only his promise keeping them apart. So even if they can't actually romantically be together, they can live the rest of their lives side by side and just be each other's companion. And for both of them, even though they want more, I mean, him on the beach at that one time when I can't remember what she said and I can't remember exactly what he said, but the intensity, the impact of what he's actually holding back and the power it takes for him to hold that back. I wish I could remember what it was that he said and I don't remember what episode it's in either, but... If you know what I mean, you know what I mean. And if you see it, you'll you'll understand. Because, like, um, she was saying something about him being... Oh, I can't remember what it was that she said. Something about, like, him being such a hero or something. And he's like, I'm not. You don't understand. Like, he, he there's nothing he desires. And he's like, he's like, okay with his life. And this is the one thing that he's like... I'm actually hating this. And I'm like that upset that I made this promise because I don't want to be single for the rest of my life. Because he loves she by this point and he wants to be with her and he can't because of the promise he made. And like he's not as, as like, I seriously can't remember the words. I'm butchering it. But if you know that scene, you know that scene. It's there. It's in the middle of the night and they're standing on the beach talking. And they're like looking at the water. But then the way he looks at her when he says that, she's like, oh. And I'm like, oh. But when you understand all of that and you get to, and, and, but then she, her engagement is back on again, forcefully without her wanting it again, she is forced back into engagement with the same guy who like selfishly like forces her back to being with him. So it's back on again. So now they can't be anywhere near each other, near each other and they can't touch each other and going to be separated forcefully. And she's going to like go off and marry this other person. And they can't even be companions anymore. They can't be friends or anything because he's never going to see her again, etc. Mm -hmm. So that scene was basically like the last, like, like, <sighs> that's the closest it came to like in other shows is like they kiss or something or they at least hug. Like she, she hugged him once she had him around the waist when she was crying and stuff. And that was a sad enough scene. But like this one was just so 
pure and so innocent and so real. Like you talk about real love. You want to know what love actually is. It's not all that passion. It's not all that whatever. You want to know a real honest to goodness. This is what love is. Look at Zhou Shang with Shi Yi in One and Only. This is an amazing portrayal of what real love does. It is so like selfless between each other and the whole reason that they can't be together and the whole aspect of like everybody as well as each other and the, like, everything. It's just incredible. And that's why Zhou Sheng is one of my favorite characters that Jilin has ever played and that's why One and Only is one of my favorite of the dramas even with an ending like that because it is just so amazingly well done. There were of course things about it that I didn't like but I don't even remember what they are right now really. I mean aside from bad guys being bad guys you always hate bad guys you should always hate the bad guys. <laughs> um, but aside from the bad guys that I hated and a couple of dumb things here and there, there's not much. Like, what really sticks out to me is how amazing this story is. So, I did not realize that I was going to talk about that one for over, and um, those two, for over an hour. But there you go, it's been over an hour and now I have to go and edit that after I edit other videos. But there you go. So, all that I've got left is the couples. <laughs> And by now you should figure, you should have an idea already which, what order the couples are in, or at the very least, which ones are my favorite. There's ties in that one too. Uh, the favorite couples, there's six, five, five, four, four, three, two, one, one, one. So go ahead and make a guess right now. And when I release that video, <laughs> let's see how close you got to being correct. And then you can let me know in the comments if you want. Thanks for watching up to this point. Bye.